start because um, I know time is of the essence. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Marisa Brazil. I'm your campus champion coordinator. Um, thank you for attending our um, fifth Tuesday ad hoc call. Um, we have a very special presentation. This is an encore of a PERC-19 presentation that many were unable to attend. It's the professionalization and career arts for roles supporting compute and data intensive research. Um, we have wonderful panelists that are online and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, um, Patrick, just to, um, to make the introductions just because I'm going to start muting people as we go and the recording's on and I'm just going to go ahead and turn it off over to Patrick Schmidt. Okay, let me, can people see it? I'm trying to screen share, is that? Um, I don't see a screen share yet. Oh. Let me, I can make you co-host if you need me to. It's on there. Okay. Now. All right. There we go. Great. All right. Um, first of all, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I want to, um, sorry, I'm just getting a few things set up on my own computer here. I'm working across a number of different. There we go. Sorry, everybody. Um, I've got to elaborate set up here for various audio and video conflict reasons. I want to thank everybody for coming and joining us today. As, as Marissa mentioned, this was a panel that we did at PERC um, this summer, and we're, we're happy to be able to do an encore of it here. Um, first of all, I want to thank the presenters that are going to be joining the panelists here. I'll introduce them as we get to their slides individually, um, but it's, uh, I want to thank Scott Yockel, Stu Geiger, Joanna Thielen, and Kurt Key. It's a really interesting set of people. This is one of those times where I'm putting together the panel and I was able to get everybody to come to this. I was just so excited um, because it's a really interesting set of folks. Uh, first of all, what I wanted to do is just give you a little bit of an introduction to some of the background. Most of you at this point, I think probably know about CARC, um, but I've just um, put this slide in there for those of you who haven't heard about it. Um, it's related to the topic, just in that this is, among other things, an organization that's really advocating for um, our profession and, and a lot of the people that are doing the work around this stuff. So I won't belabor that. But I do want to give a little bit of a background on why we want to professionalize research computing and data. Um, this came out of a, a workshop that we ran a while ago. And some of the needs that were recognized was that there is a, a national shortage of research computing and data personnel. Uh, folks who are running centers and all sorts of, of related enterprises recognize a fairly high employee turnover, not least because of um, the lures of, of um, the corporate world, which is also trying to do a lot of this kind of stuff. Another thing was that we recognize that it's fairly distinct, that the work we're doing is distinct from, even if there is overlap with both administrative IT on the one hand, as well as researchers on the other side. So we're not traditional IT people. We're also not researchers, even if we do have overlap with a lot of those things. And then we saw there was a lot of issues around um, the fact that there weren't really clear um, HR roles, there weren't clear career arcs, it wasn't always clear what a career in this area would look like. And that um, further exacerbates this problem of the uh, occupational challenges. So at the workshop, we heard from a, a sociologist um, who was talking about the process of professionalization broadly. And um, this is a really interesting talk, even if we're not necessarily trying to move towards uh, something like the medical profession or, or another um, uh, fairly developed and, and regulated entity. But even so, of these seven steps that are up on the screen, the first three definitely resonate with a lot of people that, um, you know, it made sense to have some sort of a professional association. And while I'm not asserting that CARC is that, that may be a, a good place to start or to gather some of the discussions around that. We really want to formalize and disseminate the research IT knowledge base. That's a lot of what these calls are about um, and a lot of the other activities going on. PERC is, a, is another really great place for that. And then um, we want to implement education programs for research IT professionals and organization managers. So this isn't the same necessarily as establishing a degree major, um, but again, some of 
the, the workshops and tutorials at places like Perk, a lot of the other things that are going on with the champions um, and with the carpentries and things like that definitely go to this. So the rest of them, as I say, are not necessarily germane right now, um, but they're, you know, at some point they're, they're, they may be worth thinking about. So at the workshop, some of the common themes that distinguish um, the work that we do is, is this process of co-creation, that it's not the same as just being a service provider in traditional IT, um, that it's a collaborative process. Another one was these career paths, as I mentioned, are incomplete in many orgs. So this creates challenges both for um, organizations as well as for individuals in terms of recruiting, and then the development and retention of folks, which is a big issue for sustainability. Um, the, the sort of explosion of data and of capacity. So everything from um, lots of compute to lots of storage um, and uh, as well as things like the instruments um, that are just exploding in terms of um, their capacity to generate data is, is really characterizing a lot of this work. The status that many of us enjoy is, is mixed, right? Some folks that we work with are very respectful and really value a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, and yet at the same time, there's a wide recognition that um, in many places there's kind of a two tier environment um, and that it's not the same, that you don't have the same level of respect and prestige being a staff member that you do as a faculty member. Um, and that's an issue for some folks. And then finally, we struggle with terminology. So the NSF is very fond of calling this cyber infrastructure, but that's not a term that's resonated widely um, across the, the domain more, uh, more generally. Um, we definitely overlap with and touch on things like data science and high performance computing and research data management. Um, and, and so there's all these different terms that come together. And again, there's an aspect of information technology in what we do, of course. Um, but traditional IT professionals are a different breed as well. So I just wanted to provide that background um, in sort of context setting for why we wanted to pull some of these different folks together. And with that, I will go over to Scott. So Scott's got a, uh, is the University Research Computing Officer at Harvard University. He's got a, a research background in computational chemistry um, and developed a lot of technical skills alongside research skills. Um, he, I, I like this, he said he was destined to be in research IT from the start, um, but now he's working to ensure the value of this field is well understood by local, institutional, and national leadership so that the next generation of CI professionals will be in place to support the next generation of researchers. With that, I'll turn it over to Scott. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, so in the... Um, Campus Research Computing Consortium, there's a couple of different groups that are kind of interest groups. One is around uh, CI professionalization. And like Patrick said, like one of the goals in thinking about this career as a, um, this discipline that we do as a career um, is that we will need to be able to track, retrain, diversify, and develop professionals in this space. And so in a lot of my slides, you'll see the word CI professional, but you can just interchange that with RC. If you're research computing, you wanna call it RIT. It doesn't matter. So it's the discipline of what we do is, um, and so part of the, I think you can go to the next slide. Part of the work um, that came out of a 2018 workshop was that we needed an HR framework. Um, one of the, the problems is that not having well-defined positions um, does not bode well to classifying those positions, to creating a um, hierarchy of positions or creating equity amongst uh, positions on campus with um, equal responsibility. Um, and so that's the work working group that I led. There's some other work to be done around creating career arcs that Patrick is still interested in, in pursuing. And we also always need help uh, with communications. Six, next slide. So this work that I um, helped led a group on lasted for six weeks. Um, I mostly just have this slide to just demonstrate who all was involved. Myself um, and Eric Dumans from Florida and Wayne Gilmore represented like the director level of research computing. We had um, some respective HR people like Melissa and Nicole from Hewitt, I mean from Harvard University IT HR, and also Anna um, Thronley from University of Florida IT HR. So we had some HR types. And then we also had people in other levels and capacities within research computing like Eric 
at Purdue and Brian at SCSC and Janae from Rutgers. So it was a good mixture of, of people. So, um, so first I need to teach you just quickly on a single slide, what is a job family? Um, you probably, unless you're in the hiring role, have not probably seen these. Um, and what happens is at the highest level at any organization, there is a job function. Um, so your job function may be like technology, it could be library, museums, um, HR, finance, research. So one of the things is at a university you have to decide is, is research computing, does it fall under the research job function or does it run or fall under IT? But when you go one step inside of that, then you define a family that is unique to the roles and responsibilities. And then within a family, you would have a series. And so the series concept we've been using uh, comes from the 2018 workshop where we wrote out a document um, that describes what are the roles and responsibilities and what is kind of a career in research computing. And these four different facings, as, as they're sometimes called, um, are, the, are distinct different types of roles and responsibilities. So do keep in mind that when we're creating a framework, it's, it's, it's the idea that you may at a smaller institution have roles that you know, bridge between these, but in a larger sense, there are distinct different roles in the systems facing, researcher facing, and so forth. Next. So within an individual series, uh, you have an individual contributor role and a manager role. And one of the most important things that that most of us faced is there weren't enough individual contributor roles that went up into the same equivalent levels of management. So these lines are just to show equivalence across the systems professional four and the systems manager four. They're not meant to go from one to the other regards. They're just trying to show them at the same level. Um, and so that was one of the most important things to help create a career path is to be able to have higher level individual contributor positions. Um, and a lot of universities have this in the research space. You might have a um, you know, principal scientist type role. And we wanted to have these types of roles. So this four and the five are like a lead or principal um, engineer or architect, right? You might have that in the facilitation role. You could have a, you know, a, you may only have one of these at your entire institution, um, but it, it's nice to be able to progress into that space. Next. So the components that are listed in blue are the, are the ones that are the most flexible that should be more adaptable as you change from you know, university and institution. Um, the job title, the grade level, uh, the job summary, and the minimum qualifications are the things that we wanna make sure that try, we try the most to stay fixed across your institution or across multiple institutions so that this can then later be used as kind of a, a survey against people who are in different position types. Um, so the job summary is a short little three sentence um, that summarizes the roles and responsibilities and the language in that must progress with the um, hierarchy of the roles. So, next. So just a couple of things that, that we wrote up in a, there's a larger document that demonstrates all of the uh, points of concern that we captured during the discussions of making that, the framework. So the framework is, I can't show you like a easy to look at um, like eight page Excel sheet on here, but there's, it's available online. Um, and the other thing is the things that we wrestled with. And so I just talked about the non-managerial career paths. The distinctness from IT was, was something that we really had to clearly articulate, having other HR professionals um, on the calls with us while we designed this so that we wouldn't fall into the trap more or less of inheriting enterprise IT positions for what we have. That's what we currently have been uh, fighting with. So, one of the concepts that was really important to understand is that the, um, as you progress through the leader, through the advancement of an individual contributor role um, in research computing, it tends to be that your, the discipline and the types of things that you need to understand to do be really effective, get much, much broader. So an expert at the facilitation level would have to know a lot about you know, like data structure and the systems that people are working on. If they're gonna design a really complex workflow that takes advantage of all the latest technologies for someone, they would have to understand, you know, how the technologies are implemented. Um, if you are an enterprise IT and as you go up, up the, the chain, you typically get a much more narrower focus. You may become the expert at Oracle financials at your institution or something like that. So that inversion is a very different, um, very different type of thinking about position responsibility. Um, and HR really liked that there was a distinctness like that. So that was something that you need to bring out if you're trying to use this implementation. Um, 
And also these are meant to be like mostly technical service oriented roles. Um, so the business operation, research admin, library finance, those things that you might also have in your department are not meant to be in this job family. So the job family doesn't mean that everything within research computing within your department will fall in this category, but it means all of the technical facilitation, data science, research, software engineering, those types of roles um, could fall into this family. Next. Um, and then the single series for software and data facing was an interesting point to have to wrestle with. Um, you have to really think about data science at your institution or these particular positions. If their primary role is really service oriented and not individual research, they should probably fall into the technology function. They may not fall in research computing, but they are definitely not part of the research function, which is primary individual research. And the reason why at Harvard we chose to lump them together in the research computing family is we didn't know when in the future the reclassification of research families would happen. So you may ch make choices differently for different institutions in that space. Um, and also there, the different director levels are meant to um, mostly to compare who does the director normally engage with on campus, right? Do they engage with other IT directors? Do they engage with the VPs of the university? So we wanted to make sure that we had levels that were commensurate to that. Um, next one. And there's been a few different presentations on this. Next. Um, and the other thing is that if you are interested more about hearing more about what's going on in this space, you can just email this uh, CI professionalization at CARC.org. The materials are all available. If you go to the CARC.org, there's a, a, a um, which one, a products link. You'll see the one for CI professionalization, um, which you can read the document that I summarized. It also has an, uh, a link in the document to the HR, actual HR framework. So I'm always happy to get feedback from this. This was implemented by six people who then opened it up and had, re had a review of about 30, 30 people from different universities. Um, and the more reviews and stuff that we have, the more weight I think that the document carries. And you can be, you know, you can have that conversation with HR and leadership that this isn't something that you created. It's something that like 30 plus organizations um, have created and are implementing. So thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, we're going to ask everybody to hold your questions to the end when we can have the questions go to the whole panel. Um, and so uh, next, is Stuart on the call yet? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Great. So Stuart Geiger is a staff ethnographer and principal investigator at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. Um, he got a background in history, philosophy, and anthropology of science. And he studied many different communities of knowledge production using a variety of different methods and approaches, most recently studying various issues around the institutionalization of data science in academia. And so with that, um, I will now pull up his slides. I've got a bunch of different slides here, sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at too many different slides. No, no worries. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can also vamp a bit while you're trying to find that. If <laughs> Thank you. God, I thought it had everything all set up. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for that intro. Um, I mean, so this work that we've been doing, um, uh, this is actually work that we've been doing um, at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science as part of this uh, career paths and alternative metrics working group. And we've been looking at a bunch of different things and, and we're actually kind of coming at this from more of a perspective from from the data science side, which tends to be kind of more associated with kind of the academic track um, and those kind of conversations, but we're also sort of in deep conversation um, and in talking about sort of things that are, that are happening um, across you know, research IT and high performance computing um, and a lot of others. We have, we have a whole bunch of different units um, that are all kind of doing a lot, of, a lot of things. And so the work that I'll be talking about today is work that, um, was built out of a project that, um, yeah, involves, yeah, so actually there's, there's uh, so I call this talk the human infrastructure of academic data science. And, you know, we've really been sort of tasked and what, what one of the things that we're, we're really um, trying to work on is to figure out what is needed for what's being called data science in the academy to sort of succeed um, and to thrive. Um, you can see some of our sort of current and former members there. Um, if you go to the next slide, the work that I'm gonna be uh, talking about today 
is part of a sort of three university effort um, that was funded by the Moore and the Sloan Foundations. Um, and so this is, uh, yeah, uh, uh, so we had some, some an institute at Berkeley, we had an institute at NYU, and an institute at uh, University of Washington, Seattle. And this re this research, you can kind of, there's a link to our uh, our report um, that we, we've recently put out, um, bit.ly slash careers data sci. And it's based on sort of interviews and surveys that we've done um, sort of largely based around these three uh, data, like people in the data science orbit at these three universities. But I've also gotten the chance um, to talk and engage with people at a bunch of different places um, around the US, also in the UK. I've been talking with a lot of people in like the research software engineering movement and software system sustainability. Um, that's just some icons of some of the sort of people that we're, we're talking with and thinking with through the, this with. Uh, next slide. So I'll also just briefly say some stuff that we're doing at BIDS. Uh, we're doing a lot of work also around best practices and I've sort of given, you can see the link um, there to a bunch of these reports that we've done. We've actually focused a lot on management and organizations. Um, so how, you know, the challenges of doing work in teams, labs, and groups, um, best practices for managing turnover, uh, fostering a diverse and inclusive workplace culture. So you might also be interested in some of these guides. Um, on the next slide. So generally what I sort of frame this around is I love this quote that a good infrastructure is hard to find. It's from one of my favorite like history and philosophy of science books. And what they talk about is with infrastructure, when it's working well, it disappears from the background. The whole point is to be able to sort of plug in your AC adapter into the wall and not have to think about it. And when we think about kind of infrastructural, you know, people in infrastructural positions, people who are doing that kind of work, you know, it's very easy, um, especially uh, to sort of, uh, you know, take infrastructural work for granted and uh, particularly a lot of like the invisible roles that people in, in a lot of these positions play. And that's, that's something that I really want to highlight in this talk. Um, next slide. So the high level sort of themes and tensions that I want to say is, is first off the staff versus academic track is blurring quite a, quite a lot. Historically, this has been like a very old school way that universities are sort of sharply divided into staff and academic um, with sort of people on the academic track are seen as going you know, towards a professor position um, and having advanced degrees, but we're seeing increasingly people with advanced degrees and PhDs doing a lot of infrastructural work, um, making a lot of infrastructural innovations, um, what I kind of call the software as scholarship movement. Um, and when we also see people who are not on the academic track, you know, doing things that look quite similar to research, being very deeply involved in research, teaching, grant making in ways that weren't typically imagined, um, you know, back in the 1950s when we sort of split, split you know, this into like staff and academic tracks. We also, same with the presentation we were hearing, you know, there's sort of few formal job descriptions and pathways. Um, so it really shows a need for these kinds of sort of uh, professionalization and formalization efforts. But also one of the interesting things that, that I kept, that we kept hearing is that, you know, when there's an understanding that, you know, yeah, no one's job description really reflects what, you know, what they do or their formal roles, that can actually give a lot of flexibility. And a lot of people in these positions, you know, do work that they think is really impactful um, in ways that sort of don't match their job description at all. They have a lot of agency in, in that choice. And so that's something to, to keep in mind, how do we can keep that flexibility when we formalize. There's also a whole range of things that I call postdoc problems. So uh, for if, if there's somebody with expertise that you want to hire and they have a PhD, the easiest way to often do this is to hire them as a postdoc. Um, but then there's a big question about is, are those job duties, are those opportunities, is that reporting and management structure to a professor um, appropriate for a postdoc? And the, are these people sort of maybe better suited for things on the staff track? Um, we also see data science as a useful overarching term for bringing attention to this. But we also feel like there, we need to be much, that's like too vague of a term. And we need terms like data engineering or research software engineer, or I, I really like the, the, the facings track um, for that. Split positions are also something that are increasingly common, particularly as a whole bunch of different units on campus realize that they're kind of in the same game and kind of helping the same people and sort of working on the same kinds of tasks. And we see those can be really important and then it can, they can really build campus cohesion, but they also need to be done with care because two 50% positions can add up to way more than 100% time. And also, I just want to shout out our HR departments. We've also had a good experience working with our HR departments. Um, a lot of people only go through official channels in HR. Um, and I would say get to know your HR people sort of outside of like the official forms and channels that you submit, because often they're as frustrated with some of the sort of limitations of the system and can work to make it better. Um, okay, so the next slide. So this is just sort of, a, I don't want you to actually look too deeply at this sort of uh, chart, but um, one of the things that we've been doing is just mapping out all the different kinds of roles 
um, most principally in the sort of UC, the University of California system, but also in other sort of places as well. And then different qualities and attributes around that as a way to sort of also figure out where there are holes and where there are gaps. Um, and this might be a really useful exercise if you're trying to sort of modify your own university's sort of job description or position system. Uh, next. So we also have these sort of uh, different modes and roles of data science support personnel. Um, and it's interesting how these also, this was done independently of some of the CARC efforts, but it actually aligns a bit with the, the facing tracks. So individual or people who kind of do short-term consulting, research or initiated engagements, the kind of researcher facing. Um, instruction is also kind of researcher facing, but sort of at, at scale. So teaching short workshops or traditional courses that fill in the gaps of the academic curriculum. Um, also what we call integration, which is where people are sort of, they work long term or alongside specific labs or departments um, if for sort of either indefinitely or sometimes they're there for sort of six months, 12 months, and they sort of move to a new team. Um, and then infrastructural, which is what we call sort of systems facing. Um, next. And then also this also sort of doesn't necessarily align with all the different kinds of roles that data science support personnel do, which include kind of teaching and onboarding kind of maybe those those traditional ones as well as infrastructure maintenance. But then there's also a lot of things like data and workflow development, where you might sort of help someone do it or actually do it directly, or kind of bespoke software development for like the research software engineering model where you're extending your sort of bringing software engineering expertise because there's not an existing tool um, or not an existing open source tool that sort of uh, does what you need it to do. Uh, next. And so in this, what we also find is a substantial amount of informal and invisible roles that data science support personnel sort of do. Um, the first category is what we call institutional glue. Um, and if you haven't checked out Tanya Riley's talk, Being Glue, this is kind of a fantastic uh, sort of expose of, uh, of this. Things like networking, translating, building relationships across departments and campuses and beyond. Things like CARC, this, this as well, um, are often sort of invisible but bring substantial value to the organization. Um, institutional memory, um, keeping track of what's going on, especially because there's a lot of high turnover. Um, professional development mentoring is another thing as well. Um, and then also one thing we also find is that people in data science support roles um, are often recruited for their technical expertise, but also end up teaching and consulting on things that go far beyond that. Things like scientific methods, frameworks, best practices for software engineering or data publishing, um, things like open science, reproducibility and responsible conduct of research kind of um, spaces, as well as like organizational management consulting. Um, and then also I'll have like diversity, inclusion, and equity work, as well as sort of personal counseling and therapy are things that um, you might not sort of think about as well, but can also be a form of work, um, especially if you're sort of uh, end up sort of supporting people who um, traditionally sort of fall through the cracks or sort of have a lot of imposter syndrome or are coming to a sort of researcher facing role um, because their advisor is sort of yelling at them or making them feel really you know ashamed for not knowing a particular task. This can be sort of something that there's not a lot of training for, but it's a very sort of human facing activity. Next. So I'll have the slide, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but one of the things we did is we plotted um, grad students and postdocs along these two axes of whether or not they were, wanted to stay in academia or leave academia and whether they wanted a tenure position or, or they didn't think tenure was worth it. And there's a substantial number of people who are sort of on the academic track, graduate students and postdocs, who want to stay in academia, but they don't really want to go on the traditional tenure track path to a professor. And a lot of them that I've talked to have said, oh, it's really disappointing, like I want to stay in academia, but I kind of have these skills that don't really translate to a, to a, a professor career. And these people are sort of prime for a lot of these sort of um, sort of uh, cyber infrastructure and data science support roles and doing sort of, uh, we advocate, you know, going into a lot of like departments that have a lot of kind of, you know, expertise in this area and saying, you know, if you don't want to go down the professor track and you don't want to go into industry, there's actually a huge role at the university for you. So go next. So to conclude, we kind of support, we say that, you know, we need to support, define, and advertise these existing career pathways. And we have these sort of five different sort of tracks that we have. Um, I'm also very happy to sort of advocate the, uh, the, the CART professionalization sort of approaches as well. But things like research software engineers who are doing more like systems development, um, data engineers who are like often embedded into teams to like manage pipelines, um, consultants, you know, who are doing those more traditional researcher facing roles. Um, also kind of workshop and short course instructors. Um, we end up teaching a lot of software and data carpentry workshops and it's unclear whether that should be its own sort of role or something that a lot of different people kind of do on the side. 
as well as kind of disciplinary data scientists. And these are people who we see a lot of tension where they have a lot, where people have a lot of expertise in things like DevOps or systems administration, um, but I'll also feel like they have to sort of want to contribute um, to work in, in a discipline. And so we were thinking there's a lot of role for that. Uh, next. Um, so that's sort of um, kind of our, our sort of findings on that. I want to thank, there's a lot of people to thank, uh, including our funders. I have my email there if you want to get in touch. Um, love to chat about this kind of stuff more. Thanks. Thanks very much, Stu. Um, with that, good, we're back. Next up, I want to welcome Joanna Thielen. She's Assistant Professor and Research Data and Science Librarian at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan. Um, as a research data librarian, Joanna provides consultations and training on how to effectively store, organize, and preserve research data. As a librarian for the biological sciences, chemistry, and physics departments, she provides reference, instruction, scholarly communication, and collection development services to students and faculty in these departments. Her research interests include pathways into data librarianship, implementing equitable hiring practices, and predatory publishers. And so I will take this back and good. There we go. So Great. with that, thanks. Welcome, Joanna. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so this is a um, this is a presentation will give you kind of a small snippet of the of a collaborative project that I'm working with um, Amy Neeser at University of California, Berkeley. Um, so we are trying to understand the landscape of academic data librarians within the US. Um, but before I get started talking about that research project, I'd like to talk about what librarians don't do, first of all. So next slide, please. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions and stereotypes around the word librarian, including those of us who work in academia. So next. First thing we don't do is we do not tell people to shush people. Um, we don't walk around the building just telling people to be quiet. Next. We're also not a technophobic bunch. Um, we are very much embracing technology, um, unlike this, the lady in the picture here who's using the old fashioned card catalog. And then finally, we don't just sit around and read all day. Um, when I tell people I'm a librarian, the often uh, their response is, oh, you must really like to read. It's like, yes, I do like to read, but I do a lot of other things. Um, next. So what do academic librarians actually do? Well, we provide tailored and in-depth services for researchers, all the way from undergraduates through faculty and up even through um, levels of university administration. We help them to find information as well as evaluate information. Um, and we work with them, we don't work for them, um, which is a very important distinction. Um, so with that uh, mindset, we do have a, a big, focus on providing high touch um, customer or public service, um, which may sound very similar to some of the roles that you, you are all in. Um, an interesting um, factor of academic librarianship is that many librarians can be tenure track faculty depending on their rank at their institution. Um, you, they can also be faculty members without tenure, um, staff, academic staff. There's lots of different ranks at different universities. Um, if they are tenure track faculty members, they are often required to conduct original research, present at conferences, and publish, similar to the requirements for other faculties within different dis departments. And this um, tenure track faculty status often gives those librarians a high level of autonomy to um, kind of create the job as they see fit. Next, please. So what, within academia, what do specifically data librarians do? So these jobs have evolved over the past 15 years or so to help researchers with an area called research data management. So we help researchers to find, organize, share, store, archive, and preserve their data. Um, data is a, a very, very important currency within academia, but it's highly fragile. We all have digital data or documents from even five or 10 years ago that we can no longer access for a variety of reasons. So librarians are helping to kind of to step in and to fill that um, void to help researchers um, organize their and manage their data. Um, librarians have been stepping in to do this for several reasons. It really plays off the skills that librarians have traditionally 
been experts in, like organizing things, keeping things safe for a long time, while also making them widely accessible. Those two things can seem like they're opposites, but they can actually work really well in tandem together. Next, please. Um, so Amy and I have been working on this project for a, a little over a year where we are analyzing job postings for data librarians over a five year period. So for our methodology, we're doing a qualitative coding, looking at 67 specific variables within these job postings. For example, is a salary mentioned? If so, do they give a quantitative value? Do they give a qualitative descriptor? What sort of degrees are required? Um, and those sorts of things. If you're interested in seeing all of our code books and how we're doing this qualitative coding, um, you can go to the bit.ly link that's on this slide. Next, please. Okay, so just a snapshot of some of our results so far. Um, we found that over a third of the job postings during that five year time period actually didn't use the word librarian within the job title. So this was um, one of the initial results that made Amy and I realize that within data librarianship, there's a, been a big push for libraries to recruit people outside of the tr traditional academic library pipeline. And that pipeline would be where um, a librarian would get a master's of library and information science degree, a two year terminal master's degree, um, and then join the field of academic librarianship. But now we see that they're trying to recruit people outside of that specific degree area. And the examples on the bottom of this slide are actual job titles from these postings. You can see there's a wide variety of the different types of titles that libraries are looking to hire. Next. We also looked at the types of degrees that were um, listed within the qualifications sections. We found that only about 30% of the job postings require a library science degree and won't accept a different degree, meaning that uh, about 70% will accept a different degree, often called equivalent or relevant um, degree. In terms of the disciplinary background, um, sometimes the job postings would ask for either a, um, a disciplinary background in terms of the degree or experience, like research experience, lab experience. Um, when that was mentioned, 33% um, of those postings wanted someone with a background in the STEM areas. And the second most common was someone in the area of a data intensive field or the data science field at almost 20%. Um, academic libraries are also recruiting people with programming skills. Um, we found that a third of the job postings required or preferred someone with at least a familiarity with one programming languages or programming language. Um, the bar graph on the right shows um, the frequency of the programming languages men specifically mentioned in job postings. Um, so Python and R were the most common. Libraries are also seeking a variety of data related skills. Um, so almost a half wanted some uh, candidate with skills related to data analysis. Um, both of the quotes on this slide are actual quotes from um, job postings. You can see the, the type of re uh, responsibility or qualification that was in these job postings. Um, about 20% wanted skills in data storage. Um, from my own experience working as a data librarian, it can be a huge hurdle and a huge unknown for researchers to how they actually store their data over the length of the grant or um, after the grant has um, finished. Um, so next, please. Okay. Um, so hopefully from that very small snapshot of our results, you'll see that computer and data professionals are highly valued within academic libraries. There's lots of ways in which data librarianship and IT or data science or CI are converging. Our, our work is really overlapping. Um, um, and if you like to develop new tools and services, um, academic libraries are really a place that strive to do that on a daily basis to meet unique campus needs, unique department needs, or even unique lab or researcher needs. Um, so within academic libraries, there's been an, uh, probably an exponential increase in the amount of IT related positions, mostly at R1 institutions, but it, and across the board in academia. Some of the job postings we were looking at were even at smaller baccalaureate institutions or even special focus 
um, institutions like medical schools or health sciences schools. Next, please. Um, so if you or someone you know is interested in the world of academic librarianship, we have a few tips for you of how to kind of decode these job postings. Um, so first, looking at the required degrees. Um, most importantly, seeing is it required to have that traditional Master's of Library and Information Science degree. At some universities, it is a hard and fast requirement for a librarian to have that. At other institutions, it's not. Um, but as I mentioned before, often the equivalent or a relevant degree is accepted. And the example here is um, directly from a job posting in very common language. But the big caveat with this is what is considered equivalent or relevant at one institution can, is not necessarily equivalent or relevant at, the, at another institution. Um, so one of our big takeaways from this research project is Amy and I are going to try to um, use the results of this project to convince academic libraries to be much more specific in their job postings so that the candidate doesn't have to decode what it actually is an equivalent degree or not. Next, please. Um, looking to see if the position is tenure track or not, which can have a huge response, huge effect on your day-to-day -day responsibilities. So looking for things like academic status, is it faculty, staff? Um, and when in doubt, ask. Um, a lot of times things are not as clear as they could be within the job posting. So hopefully there's a way we can contact the head of the search committee, HR at the university, or HR within the library. Libraries are really trying to recruit nine librarians to work in their um, institutions. But this is a new area for academic libraries. They've really only been doing this for the past 10 or 15 years, and they're struggling with how to make the job postings attractive to non-librarians while and use language that isn't library jargon. Um, so even myself being a librarian, it sometimes can be a little difficult to decode what they're actually looking for. So when in doubt, ask. So thank you. Um, here are both of our emails. If, you're in, if you um, have follow-up questions, we're happy to share more of the results or any of the um, methodology that we developed for this project. Thanks very much, Joanna. And our last presenter today is Kurt Key, Associate Professor of Communication. Actually, I don't know if I've got um, your, your actual title. He's now at Texas Tech. He was at Chapman um, when we were doing this this summer. Um, but he's going to be so, uh, Associate Professor of Media and Communication at Texas Tech. He's a social scientist of sober cyber infrastructure, and he began to study the organizational capacity of CI projects after observing in his dissertation research that the lack of organizational capacity presents important challenges to CI development and implementation on a daily basis. And with that, I will bring up his slides. Thanks very much, Kurt. Okay, thank you, Patrick. And um, I actually browse through the list of people on the call right now. I would like to first um, uh, start by thanking many of you who have participated in the interviews conducted by my research team and, and I. Without your input, uh, we would not have been able to make sufficient progress on the study. And I also take this presentation as an opportunity uh, to give back to the community by sharing a preliminary model. Um, so um, next slide, please. Um, so let me continue with providing a quick overview of the, of the study. Um, so we interview a range of CI professionals for the study. Uh, some of them are administrators and technologists, as shown on the top row of this uh, visual. And uh, we also talk to three different types of users, as shown on the middle row. And finally, uh, as shown on the bottom row, we interview uh, CI liaisons and outreach educators, as well as people who play multiple roles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also asked uh, the CI professionals to indicate um, their relationships to CI projects. So type one are people, uh, type one people are CI professionals who build organizational capacity of their own projects and type two people are CI professionals who build capacity of projects of other PIs and users they support. Um, next slide, please. So with about approximately uh, slightly over 100 interviews, my project team and I generated this preliminary model of organizational capacity. And by capacity, by organizational capacity, we refer to a CI project's ability to carry out daily activities towards the long-term goals of developing solid CI technologies and doing breakthrough science. 
Uh, in this model, we identified 12 elements across three different levels that we believe can help build and increase capacity to accelerate cyber infrastructure adoption. In other words, uh, we believe that if we can intentionally and strategically enhance these 12 elements, more people can get on cyber infrastructure faster and more successfully. Um, let me begin with the project bubble in the middle of this um, uh, current slide. The first element is personnel, and that refers to the men and women who make up the human capacity of cyber infrastructure projects. Without them, cyber infrastructure projects will not have the capacity, capacity to be functional on a daily basis. Um, the second element is collaboration technologies, and they refer to tools as, such as Wiki, Slack, Zoom, and many other platforms that allow dispersed collaborators to work virtually together. And the third element is adaptive organizing, which refers to the mindset that allows project to be preemptive, nimble, and sometimes learn from unavoidable issues, which can then be turned into lessons learned and wisdom to continue helping projects pivot quickly. And the fourth element is external communication which refers to a project's um, efforts in putting out publications and conference presentations, and some of the intentional efforts in carrying out PR and marketing activities to build projects um, reputation. Um, next, let's shift, to our, uh, shift our attention to the university bubble on the left. Uh, so we begin with the university decision makers. Uh, throughout the interviews we conducted, participants talked about how university decision makers play a critical role in providing incentives and creating policies and initiatives uh, that can help build capacity for cyber infrastructure adoption, especially when these decision makers write cyber infrastructure into their strategic plans. Um, second, we have interdisciplinary norms, which refers to the cultures on individual campuses that promote and reward cyber infrastructure projects that cross disciplinary boundaries. Such um, culture may specifically reward faculty users efforts in their tenure and promotion cases. And third, we have research computing support. And this refers to the cyber infrastructure professionals at university campuses who conduct one on one consulting and workshops that help new users learn how to get on cyber infrastructure with technical capacity. And finally, we have um, uh, students and not only do students provide human capacity to cyber infrastructure projects when they are intellectually motivated or when they see a career in the cyber infrastructure work workforce, students can also provide a push for curriculum developments that can further enhance the overall capacity of cyber infrastructure projects in the long run. Uh, moving on to the community bubble on the right, uh, we start with influencers. And these are high flyers who inspire new users to want to get on cyber infrastructure. Um, they may not engage in direct interactions with new users, but they are the role models that others want to emulate. Uh, next, we have peer-to-peer -peer support, and that refers to faculty PIs and users who help others get on cyber infrastructure, either within their domains or across domains. Uh, these are uh, uh, what makes the peers uh, different from influencers is in peer to peer support experienced uh, faculty PIs actually help their colleagues on a frequent and ongoing basis. Uh, third, we have the facilitator networks and that refers to all of you on the call and you are the CI professionals who connect projects, campuses, and domains across the country and the world in building the long-term vision of cyber infrastructure. Um, finally, on this slide, we have the consortia, and that refers to Exceed National Labs and other regional and state initiatives in building cyber infrastructure. Um, next slide, please. Um, so on this slide, we see the normal, normal bell curve of technology adoption that many of you are familiar with. Uh, this bell curve also shows the five classic adopter groups uh, from the first group of innovators and early adopters all the way to laggards. And my research team and I believe that if we can strategically enhance the 12 elements in the model discussed on the previous slide, we can achieve what is shown on the next slide. Okay, and that is where we move the original blue bell curve to the accelerated red bell curve 
uh, and that's the ultimate goal of this particular study. And if you have suggestions on how to modify and improve the prelim preliminary model, please do not hesitate to reach out and we welcome your feedback. Uh, and further, it is our plan to roll out a questionnaire that can convert the um, interview model uh, to, the, to a quantitative study and we hope to be able to enroll some of the CI professionals and CI users across the country to help us statistically validate the model. Um, we anticipate to do that in the spring semester. If you're interested, please reach out. And with that, I thank all of you for your attention and also NSF for the um, support of this project. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kirk. And thanks all. Unfor um, Scott had to run. He's, he's got to catch a train. Um, but um, the rest of the folks are going to be here. We don't have a lot of time for questions, but we'd welcome um, any questions from the folks on the call. Marissa, maybe you can help with us um, with the ones on the chat as well. Absolutely. I actually have one question for you too. Um, um, so I've seen like some of these I don't know, I've seen it kind of mentioned a couple of different ways, like maybe invisible roles or, or I, like I saw some roles, um, academic coordinators. Um, so it's like some of the work that I do, which is more on the communications and outreach and community engagement side, um, how, how does that fit into the spectrum of roles that you're outlining there? Is it, is it more administrative and business or is it, because I feel like, understanding this community um, is, is, it's not something that you can just easily step into as somebody doing that communications and outreach piece. You actually have to uh, understand, you know, what research computing is and the value of all of your roles. Is there, do you anticipate seeing some sort of um, professionalization of this type of role? So I'll, let me make one comment and then I'll let the panelists answer. The one thing that I will say is, um, and um, Amy, who's probably still on the call, um, will laugh because I was always going on about this while I was at Berkeley, which is that um, everybody who's on a team supporting this kind of work is going to have to have marketing and communications as part of their role. Now, that, that doesn't um, undermine the importance of someone who's actually got serious expertise in marketing and communications, um, but I think everybody in the profession, both from the perspective of how do you tell the story effectively, but as well from a professional development perspective, really needs to think about doing a lot more of this kind of work. Um, having said that, I know Kirk has recognized that role within the, um, the university infrastructure. Um, and I don't, Scott, I don't think he, he was focusing fairly narrowly. I don't mm -hmm. know if uh, Stu or Joanna wants to comment on that as well. Um, yeah, I might come in as well. I, I definitely, that wasn't something that I included as one of the top level, but um, definitely, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right about needing to have that kind of sort of specific expertise in order to sort of do um, kind of communication outreach, like building communities, um, especially like if you're taking something from like a small, like a smaller unit and sort of really scaling it up across a campus. Um, I also see this, you know, and this is in a different aspect, but also um, I see this issue around the expertise with um, kind of traditional sort of scientific, you know, uh, groups and labs and departments um, that also like need to, you know, you can't, it's not sort of fungible. You, someone who has like deep expertise in biology, uh, you know, brings a whole lot that may not be able to sort of immediately jump into something in physics, but our HR systems often sort of treat those communication roles and, and outreach roles as fungible. And so I feel like the need to sort of support that kind of, whether it's like a domain specific expertise or a cyber infrastructure or HPC specific expertise um, to be able to message and get the word out about this kind of stuff is crucial. I'd also like to add that from the academic library standpoint, um, marketing and outreach and communication with um, the, the university is is a really important part of what we do and a very part, a part that you learn, I think, the difficult way. <laughs> Within academic libraries, you can create these terrific services, spaces, and have these really knowledgeable um, staff who are, are willing to meet and work with patrons but that's not sustainable if nobody's actually using those services or spaces or, or meeting with staff. So a lot of it is getting the word out and advocating for the value of libraries on campus because um, um, there's a very traditional 
um, viewpoint of what an academic library is, which is why I purposely started my presentation saying this is what academic librarians don't do, um, and then go into more of what we do do. Thanks. Um, so I see Tim Middlecoop had a, a comment about um, an individual um, that they have an individual doing something similar and it's more of that project management and also the CI glue. And I have Chris Collins that, um, making a couple of comments. Um, Christy, do you want to mute yourself and make those comments or it looks like one of them was there's a salary difference um, that's significant on the order of tens of thousands, but I'm not sure which role you're referring to, Chris. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, I worked in corporate America. I've also worked in libraries and I worked in education. Um, you know, when you switch back and forth, this, the salary difference is, you know, tens of thousands of dollars easily because um, I've done it. Um, with that said, you know, most people aren't willing to take a pay cut on, on that order. It's just like a generic comment from what I've seen, you know, about switching back and forth between academics or, or healthcare, which I also worked in, and business. Um, is that sorry, it's a very real thing, Chris. I mean, I know um, I myself came back from industry and I think um, it, it goes to the point of how do we recruit um, because you're right, especially in the Bay Area and other centers where there's a lot of corporate activity or industrial activity, you can't hope to compete on salary. And so we don't, we actually don't even mention that. We don't even completely open about the fact that you're going to take a big pay cut if you're going to come to the university and you do it because of the work. And so there's people who really want to do that. Um, I had another colleague who used to joke about people coming in from the cold um, who, who came back from industry to academia because they decided they wanted to do something more important than build another ad platform or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a real thing. You're absolutely right. And that's also why it's, the retention is such a big problem. Um, and so a lot yep. of your sustainability um, for your staff retention is going to be around professional development, making sure that they're getting to do interesting, exciting things, making sure that folks get to grow and learn new things and, and that they're actually connected to that mission that brought them to the university. But it's a really important point. You're right. You're absolutely right. No, that's Can I true. add a comment? And my second point. Oh, sure. Go ahead. I just want to say that um, that very question is one thing that we're looking at in our research study that Joanna was talking about. Um, we're trying to identify what are the skills and we're seeing like, oh, if you're requiring programming languages and these extra technical skills and librarians and then tracking what the salaries are. We're hoping that um, librarians will be able to advocate and say, look, I have these specialized skills. I need to make more money. Um, so we're definitely thinking about that also. Okay. And, and the other problem is, is more of a skill set issue, which is kind of touched upon over here. Um, when I started many decades ago, um, you know, everybody, their, a system administrator was not a system administrator. They were a network administrator, a storage administrator, an application administrator, a programmer, pick whatever you want. And it was kind of all lumped in together. And over the last, you know, several decades, it's all kind of specialized um, where, you know, you, the DBA didn't have administrator access, couldn't do anything with the networking. Colleges are slightly different depending on the size. Um, this whole concept of DevOps that they've been, you know, um, marketing for the last handful of years is really going back to the original model where basically you had one-stop shopping, one person and or a group of people that would have, a, you know, a series of skill sets that would basically allow you to do anything. Um, and I think one of the biggest issues, again, that I tend to run into a lot of the universities is those people are not as prevalent as they used to be because th they've been... Um, specialized and then in effect priced out of the market um, as long as the technology is there. I mean, some of the people in database specializations or whatever, I mean, they're making, you know, crazy money um, outside. Um, but when the technology changes, that skill set is no longer need. I've seen that happen over the years. Um, so that's something else to consider. One of the things that I've, that I've seen is, uh, you know, especially when you talk about job postings and things like that, um, you want to get somebody that can learn. I think that's probably the most important thing. If they've shifted back and forth between different technologies, um, that's definitely a plus. But again, I don't think they're as prevalent as they used to be 20 or 30 years ago. So well, those I, are my only two comments. I appreciate that, Chris. And I think it raises another point that's related to the one that Marissa brought up about communication skills. Um, the the so-called soft skills, which really aren't soft, they're really important. Um, 
But in organizations where you have a lot more specialized uh, facilities on the IT side in particular, being able to effectively network, that is to say, build a team of partners at your university and across different universities is becoming more and more important. Um, the ability to just sit in a room and, and code on your own is becoming um, insufficient, if you will. And so you know, that's one of the things that I think a lot of places are looking for folks that can negotiate and work well with others and build a sort of a network of partners across a campus that actually are providing all this support. Because you're right, there, there's a lot more specialization and you're gonna have to be able to work with specialists in a variety of different areas. So, so um, I know we're um, coming up at the top of the hour. I just, um, it's 1.01 p.m. my time. Um, I can continue the recording and anyone who can still hang on for our panelists can continue asking questions. Um, Cause I know there are a couple of folks that um, volunteer to stay online. I do have, um, Stu, before you um, answer, I have Ruth Marinshaw that also had a question. Um, do you want to uh, wrap up the comment on that, Stu, and then we'll move on to Ruth? Okay, sounds good. And I can stay for a few, uh, a little bit after. Great. Um, so yeah, one of the things that, that we've seen a lot is, um, you know, on, on both those issues, actually, salary and specialization, um, how a lot of graduate students are increasingly, like, play, playing a lot of these roles. Um, and it can actually be, like, someone who enters, like goes into a PhD after having some experience sometimes in the software industry, but is explicitly left the software industry you know, to go be a biologist or a physicist, ends up kind of, sometimes they can end up sort of being the DevOps you know, person in their lab and, and not actually doing the thing that they you know, got into grad school to do. And I think that that's um, just kind of a pain point because I think, I think especially as grad students get paid just a lot less than um, any, any, in almost anywhere, everyone else on campus, uh, much less the, uh, the tech industry, that ends up being a way in which like some, some of those like labor holes get filled. And that's just sort of a pain point that we wanted to sort of bring some attention to, which it can be really good for some people who end up like going into maybe a different career in that, you know, after their PhD, but um, providing that opportunity um, instead of understanding like, well, what exactly is a PhD student going into the program and going into a lab, a domain science lab, you know, to do. Um. Okay, Ruth. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. This was really fascinating. Even though I'm part of CARC, I wasn't able to attend the workshop at PERC, so this was absolutely wonderful. So I wondered, we opened with Patrick and Scott talking about professionalization within the what some call cyber infrastructure and Patrick and Scott noted, yeah, that doesn't resonate, whatever advanced research computing and then Stu and others elaborating and Joanna talking about the professionalization that exists already within the library community. For those presenters who are still on, would your own career trajectory have been different if when you entered the field, there were professional advanced research computing and data job classifications available? And that's the end of my question. So it's <laughs> a great question, Ruth. Who's going to tackle that first? Well, I, um, I mean, I, I don't have a great deal to say. I'm, I came into it a little bit later in my career, so it's a little bit less common, I think. Um, I did spend a lot of years in industry and then came back to the university, and so I wasn't coming in uh, through a PhD program or through a typical, um, a typical arc, I don't think. And um, I will say that it would have made um, the work that I did a lot easier um, because it would have been a lot easier to recruit people. Um, okay, fair enough. That's important. But I'll let others comment. I, I might say, like, I'm a, uh, you know, my, my original background is sort of history and philosophy of science, and so, but I actually entered compute, uh, my undergraduate as a computer science major because I was, like, interested in computers, and I could, like, do a little bit of, like, hacky scripting and was, like, very much, almost, like, pretty much kicked out of computer science as a major because it was a very theoretical program, and I was, like, but I want to, like, script some things, and they're, like, no, this art, what computer science is, is very 
theoretical and mathematical and, and you didn't do so well in calculus. And so this probably isn't the right degree for you. And that actually was what sent me to the humanities. I feel like if I had like a, a program that was like, I was in it, but I was doing basically my own kind of self-learned like kind of DevOpsy types of stuff. I was like running my own website and mail server and things like that. Had I had known that, um, you know, or had there been sort of programs available to me that said that this is actually something that, you know, those skills are valuable and important as well. Um, I might have also taken, I might not have gone through the humanities and then come back to this, you know, decade uh, and a half later. <laughs> interesting. Thank you. And for my career path, it was, um, I've been in the academic uh, track um, pretty much the whole time, but I did start uh, with an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering. And when I finished um, my engineering uh, education, I was fascinated um, with the organizational and social aspects of technologies and engineering infrastructure. That's why I went on to get my PhD in organizational communication and study um, this particular community. And because of that, um, project, what I'm doing right now in my own social and communication research is I'm moving towards computational social science and computational communication research. Um, um, so I see myself going back and forth between uh, the social and the technical. Um, and I think that that makes um, my work and my career more interesting um, for myself. Um, so that's my, my situation. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. I saw a comment from Jeff Boucher in the chat. Um, I don't know if Jeff, you're still on. Hi, nice to hear from you. Yeah, I'm still here. Great. Um, I just wanted to comment briefly on it, that in the course of doing the work that uh, Scott was doing, they kept coming up against situations where people who did not have a PhD um, or who did not have some of the other initial requirements that people thought should be associated with different areas, they said, well, I wouldn't be able to get into this and I'm doing the job now. And they ended up shifting most of their language away from having um, requirements for particular degrees to be very careful to throw out, say, or equivalent experience. Because there are many people, I mean, I, I don't have a PhD and um, it, it hasn't limited what I do. Although occasionally I'm aware of the fact that there are those who believe that you should have a PhD in physical sciences to be doing this job. And I I am somebody who just doesn't believe in that at all. Um, but I do think that it's, again, that's a little bit of the carryover from the fact that we are very closely aligned to an academic enterprise where most of the people on the faculty side are there with a PhD. There are very, very few people who are professors and, and don't have a PhD. Um, it's just one of the, it's part of their world. And so that's what they understand. But I do think that that was something that was that they recognized in the course of doing all the, the HR ladders that they couldn't make that and they didn't want to make that and it wasn't realistic to make that a requirement. Um, I'd like to go back to Ruth's question. Um, so I think I might have a little bit different perspective. I'm actually only three years out of graduate school. Um, so I think having some sort of framework or a set of guidelines around um, the professionalization of our of, of librarianship would have been really helpful to me because um, being a, uh, an early career professional, I just remember what it was like for myself and my classmates. You're just desperate for a job at the end of graduate school. A lot of my classmates had, you know, crippling amount of debts, but that mean they were kind of ripe for, to take essentially any job that they could get. Um, so a framework I think would have helped some of us to advocate for better pay and also more realistic responsibilities, which I think Stuart mentioned in his talk of how having two 50% positions really adds up to much more than 100%. Um, so with, you know, early career professionals really just being desperate for any sort of job needing to get that first few years of experience, it really means that we're really um, ripe for burnout and for people leaving academia or the profession in general, which is um, not a good sign for any profession. Yeah, thank you for that, Amy. Appreciate that. And if I can circle back to Marisa's question, just to make a quick comment. Um, I think the um, communication expertise is undervalued. Um, sometimes, as Patrick referred uh, to in the in the field, we may see that as a soft skill. Uh, but I think that's 
perhaps why some of the smaller scale CI projects tend to not have a full-time person doing um, communication and outreach and, and PR and marketing. And I think that that is um, a, a, a challenge in, in the field. And if we could strategically uh, built into the budget of cyber infrastructure projects going forward and really dedicate a position, a person to do this work, I think that we can uh, tremendously advance the community forward, both um, socially, politically, and, um, and culturally. Thanks for that. Um, so it was interesting what I kind of identified was that late forgotten <laughs> or like uh, invisible role, but also um, as someone who has 250 percent effort roles. Um, it's, it, it is, it's a struggle, but, and, and that's kind of my role at both of my institutions in, um, you know, I've, I've started to build a network of people who do what I do at their different institutions. It's very small. Um, and it's interesting to see how many people have duplicate roles. Like they, you know, they might, you know, they've kind of fallen into this um, for various reasons, but, um, but it's, you know, it, it is very important. And I often see, I think even at uh, the Kirk workshop that we were at last week, there was, there was a call for people who can help communicate the message out and, and, you know, get the word out. And, you know, the, the, these are valuable resources that are coming out of Kirk. And, you know, how do you get the message out to the larger community about how, you know, like, this is, this is all about you and, you know your future um, and professionalizing your roles, and it's that's really important. And how do you communicate that out to your leadership and and your universities? And um, but yeah, I like I kind of kind of feel somewhat like invisible or <laughs> trying to figure out where I fit in. <laughs> yeah, if I could pick up on that, um, one of the things that like in the academic track, this is sort of understood as like part of the job description is like, you're going to go to conferences with your colleagues at other universities and you're going to talk about things that are sort of universal to the profession and to the discipline and then come back and then you're going to share with all your colleagues what you learned and your entire your unit is going to be better for that exchange. And I feel like that there, and from my sense is that in some sort of organizations on the staff side, that's a part of it, but, but definitely not as much and it's just as crucial um, and so building that in not just to job descriptions but also kind of culturally and organizationally and providing funding and professional development uh, you know opportunities and also places where people can you know share and normalize like you know we just went to Kark and what did we learn and and uh, or perk and what did we you know and those sort of things I feel like is something that organizations uh, can can do yeah I, I couldn't agree with you more Stuart and I also think you know, there's a host of different benefits that come from that, you know, given that you are working with academicians for whom publishing is so core, um, having staff groups that actually have a publishing track record, especially um, at venues like Perk, where you're actually having peer reviewed papers um, is huge just in terms of appreciating their experience, but also earning their respect. Um, and I think that's a, a really important thing. I also want to point out this is a great opportunity for um, advancing the diversity on your teams. There's, you know, in addition to um, inherent diversity or sometimes thought of as demographic diversity, you know, the background diversity is a really important thing. And if you're, if you can find a place for people in the social sciences and humanities to contribute on your staff side, um, they often bring much stronger communication skills. They're much better writers. Um, we've had great success um, with internship programs where you find like an English chem double major or um, we, had, we had really interesting double majors of English and some STEM field and they turned out to be really great at helping with uh, the communication side of things. Um, we, we were really lucky at Berkeley to have somebody who um, was a longtime IT architect but also a professional writer. Um, he worked half time for us and half time as a novelist. And so he worked as our editor and th those are unusual folks, but you know, this is, it's a great reason not to just hire a bunch of scientists who know a lot about computing. And if I can add to that with an analogy, I think there's a fallacy in the, in the community that if you built it, they will come. Um, but I think that <laughs> the community has really learned that if you build it, they may not come and mm -hmm. they may come and leave. Um, so we do need to broaden our, our, our scope and to really include um, folks from 
social sciences and humanities to into the mix so that we can advance the cyber infrastructure vision together. Yep. That was awesome. Well, I, I apologize for hijacking the tail end of that conversation. I thought, I, I've been thinking about it a lot and it was, it was, yeah. it was interesting. Um, so I received a couple of questions from people asking if you would be willing to share your slides. Um, yes, I think us. we can do that. Um, we'll gather them up um, into PDF or something, and then I'll send them. I'll send you a link, Marissa, okay. and we'll share those out. Okay. And so once I receive that, um, I'm, I'll go ahead and um, include the recording and send them all out together, and we can um, share them out across various communities. Thank you to everyone who stuck around. Thank you very much to our panelists. Um, and well, thanks Patrick. so much for having us. Yeah, it was, this was a great fun. chance to share this more broadly with the community. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, this, this was great. We're getting lots of positive comments from, um, from people who are still on the line. So um, that's impressive. It's 116. So I, with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And thank you again. All right. Thanks, thank you. Thank you.